Um, I don't know why it's not using the webcam. Oh, sorry. Oh. Mm. the worst. We could just put your laptop up there. <laughs> um. Webcam. <laughs> Do we have a time that we're thinking we just start? Can we just put your laptop up there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, you mind if I said that there? Thank you, sir. Education rather than just mobilization and reaction. So we are here tonight to deepen our understanding of the historical context of this moment. Before we begin, uh, we have a few brief announcements, uh, very important announcements. The first one 
There is a staff rally tomorrow at uh, Waterman Front Steps, 12 p.m. This is uh, from UBM Staff United who are rallying for a uh, better standard of living. And um, I think many of us can connect our struggle uh, fighting for the Palestinians to the struggle for uh, higher wages here. So I think. Um, Every single student, we encourage to show up to this tomorrow. And even if you're not a student, uh, show up and support the UVM staff united. The second announcement, we are in contact with a man from, from Gaza who uh, has lost several family members. Um, and many of you may have seen the photo. We decided not to show it here, but it's a photo of number of his family members who were uh, lined up against a wall outside of Chief of Hospital and uh, shot in uh, firing squad style. Um, we are in touch with this man. He's trying to evacuate the remaining family members from Gaza. And uh, there's been a lot of talk about the role of charity in our movement. Uh, and. Uh, the consensus we've reached is that uh, you cannot stop a charity. There is nothing inherently transformative about charity. That said, this is very important. Please do donate generously to this. And uh, with that, I would like to introduce our guest. Uh, Thomas Suarez is a historical researcher, an author, former West Bank resident, and uh, most recently, uh, published the book, uh, Palestine Hijacked, How Zionism Important to Part State State from the River to Sea. It was described by Noam Chomsky as, uh, quote, a damning story ever documented, far too revealing to be tolerated. We are honored to welcome Thomas Suarez here today. I intend as proactive, hands-on tools towards doing whatever we can as individuals and collectively toward ending the violence for everyone in historic Palestine and making the land the river to sea into what it always should have been, one in which all its people, no matter who they are, no matter how they got there, and everyone who since 1948 has been thrown off can live in peace, security, equality, and dignity. If anything I say is if anything I say does not withstand scrutiny towards that, by all means in the QA, please challenge it. Nothing I say but I mean to be merely theoretical or history for its own sake. Now, right off, we face a problem. We face the problem that whereas all of us here, I am sure, categorically condemn deliberate violence against civilians and as terrorists, no matter who does it to whom, unfortunately, the United States and the so called West in general do not agree with us and instead finance and arm terrorism in historic Palestine, block any attempt by the UN to stop it, and muzzle us on his behalf. This is so ingrained in us that we self-censor. We self-censor constantly, without even being aware of it. And so we need to take a step back, reinvigorate our voices, free from the landmines of what we may say and what we may not say free from addressing the issue on their terms. And so I'd like to start right off by stepping on a landmark with the most urgent but taboo subject of October 7, 2023, because that day offers a microcosm of the past century. There remain endless questions about what happened that day, 
But what is uncontested is that it was the greatest challenge to Israel from within Palestine since 1948. And the unison response of the West was of such thunder that the slightest hint of curiosity about what happened and why is in silence as complicity and terrorism. In, in the UK where I live, people were arrested and convicted on terrorism charges merely for possessing an image of a hand fighter or for suggesting that the people of Gaza had the right to resist. The enforced script we were given goes like this. It was Israel's 9-11 of a pogrom. Summed up with the constantly repeated catchphrase, it was the deadliest day for Jews since the Holocaust. 76 years of manufacturing our consent is contained in this simple mantra. The problem with it is not statistics. The problem is not that many of the Israelis killed were military in the course of the siege of Gaza. The problem is not that many of the civilian victims were killed by the IDF, not Hamas. And the problem is not even the irony that the reason the victims were Jews is that Israel had ethnically cleansed the region of non-Jews and only allowed the Jews to settle. The problem, rather, is the purpose of the mantra and the purpose of atrocity propaganda spread even by the U.S. president. The reason for all of it is to plant the lie that October 7th was rooted in hatred of Jews, reinforcing the carefully nurtured Bible that Palestinian liberation is somehow tainted with anti-Semitism. The deadliest day since the Holocaust is a masterpiece of propaganda because its actual message is that the Palestinians are the Nazis and deserve to be dealt with as such, and that Israel carries in its bosom the moral authority of Nazis and the Nazis' victims are hidden inside it, unsaid, yet screamed at us. The irony goes still deeper because it is the Zionists who are guilty of what Hamas is accused of, that is, targeting Jews because they are Jews. More on that later, but we are being fed the imagery of Hamas as motivated by hatred of Jews in order to smear the Palestinians with the same brush to numb us with their genocide. The deadliest day since the Holocaust is a particularly cynical example of how Israel exploits the memory of the Nazis' victims in order to further its own racial nationalist crimes in their name. So let's start by separating October 7th into three parts. One, Hamas's breaching of the barrier within which the people of Gaza are trapped. That is to say, its attempt to liberate the concentration camp that is the Gaza Ghetto. We are told that this was an attack. Why? Why would the hanging lighter be seen as a symbol of liberation? Was the Warsaw Ghetto uprising an attack? Two, <laughs> two, Hamas's actions once on the other side of that wall, which of course, whatever the truth, must be examined and any crimes condemned. And three, the Israeli state must finally, after 76 years, be held to the same standards to which we hold Hamas. So let's try the experiment. Let's rewind 76 years and hold Israel to the same standards to which we hold Hamas. Gaza. Gaza is simply a contiguous region of Palestine, a famously beautiful region with a history dating back millennia until 1948, when the Israeli theft of land beyond that to which it had ostensibly agreed in the UN partition plan severed the region from what became the West Bank. At the same time, the Zionist armies violently uprooted people who lived on land taken by Israel on both sides of partition, but who were not Jewish. And to be clear, not being Jewish was and remains Israel's sole criteria for who it throws off the land and places under apartheid versus 
goes in haste to set them in their place. The common idea of a conflict between Israel and the Palestinians paints a false image of this word, some real estate dispute for which the Palestinians were eternally dissatisfied. By the end of 1948, many of Israel's victims ended up in Gaza, either pushed there directly or first having been driven into the sea, literally. As Israel cleansed the land of non-Jews, we sat idly by and dubbed the victims refugees and the hellholes in which they ended up refugee camps. Now, a refugee camp is a camp for people displaced by conflict or natural disaster on account of which are unable to return home. So even during 1948, this terminology was a bit of a stretch, but by early 1949, at the latest, the terms refugee and refugee camp were patently wrong. The displaced Palestinians were perfectly able to go home. They were no longer refugees if the term ever applied. Yet, they were named in camps, dying from cold, hunger, and disease. Why? The single reason they remained in camps then, and the sole reason they remain in camps today, is that the Israeli state blocks them from going home, because they are not Jewish, end of story. So these are not refugees and refugee camps, they are interned people. And internment camps, they are Israeli internment camps for Palestinian non-Jews paid for by the same international community that now pays for their genocide. The term refugee and refugee camp, this terminology, instead makes Israel blocking people from their own homes sound like some tragedy of history for which no one is to be to blame and about which nothing can be done. And I am not nitpicking semantics. The world accepts that there are refugees. The world accepts that there are refugee camps. The world does not accept interned people and internment camps. And to be sure, I'm not suggesting that the refugee terminology was a premeditated conspiracy. I am saying that it conveniently fit the needs of the Israeli state and its Western buddies. Whereas accurate language would have caused the public outrage it should have and made the crime untenable. But we need to use this tool now. Challenging the term refugee camps forces over the topic of who these people are and why they are in camps. The interned Palestinians no more need Israel's permission to go home than any of us here in this room need Israel's permission to go to our homes tonight. And liberating the camps would change everything, river to sea. Israel's determination that non-Jews would not go home was a key reason why it assassinated UN, the UN mediator, Tom Verdon, in September 1948. And to be sure, it was the Israeli state not the stern gang, as is commonly believed, that arranged the murder. In early 1949, displaced Palestinians did indeed try to go home, both from Gaza and the West Bank. When they did, they were shot dead on sight, or captured, tortured, and pushed into the desert. Israel called people trying to go home infiltrators. And we readily accepted this Orwellian newspeak. The siege of Gaza, which we are told began in Hamas, was already in effect, as were Israeli atrocities against these very people it kept in turn. Israeli aircraft conducted strafing missions over Gaza as well as the West Bank, and massive ground attacks against Gaza came in as early as 1953, when future Israeli Prime Minister Arab Sharon conducted what a UN body described as, quote, an appalling case of deliberate mass murder. These continued throughout the years, and in 1957, Israel killed hundreds of people in Gaza, quote, in cold blood and for no apparent reason, in the words of a UN committee. 
The story in the West Bank was the same. The population was kept in a constant state of terror, attack, and atrocity. After the 1967 war, Israel formalized its racial bontestanization of Palestine by issuing all non-Jews ID cards, assigning them to East Jerusalem, the West Bank, or Gaza. Israel treated the three Bantustans as, as analogous to heaven, purgatory, and hell. Non-Jews could be forced from East Jerusalem to the West Bank, or from the West Bank to Gaza, but they could never go the other way. Since 1948, Gaza has always been Israel's torture dungeon. So, the decades go by, and the camps overflow in Gaza, in the West Bank, in surrounding countries, and, according to Israel, in Israel itself, one of these internment camps for non-Jews, Shufa, is in East Jerusalem, which Israel claims to have next. So, as regards to why they return, the people of Shufa don't even need to return, they're already there. Yet, they're in internment camps. The West's so-called peace process has always been, been a fraud to buy time for Israel, and such was the case with Oslo. Oslo essentially normalized Israeli crimes back to 1948, but in exchange, the Palestinians were told that they could now have their own pseudo-government, the Palestinian Authority. Now, so this was a little more than shingles hung on doors in Ramallah. It had no power. And instead, it served as a fig leaf for Israeli apartheid and as a means to have the international community put the bill for Israel's occupation. And by the way, I'm using the term occupation here in a specific sense. In, in general, I am very weary of us arguing with the term occupation. If anyone is interested in my research, please ask me at the Q&A. Nor did Oslo do anything to ease the constant state of terror in which Israel kept the Palestinians. For a glimpse of that terror, I'll quote from the eminent journalist Chris Hedges in Gaza in 2002, that is, after Oslo and before Hamas. He wrote that he knows more, he had covered many, but until the idea in Gaza, he, quote, had never before watched soldiers entice children like mice into a trap and murder them for sports. Come 2006, and the Palestinians are told they can hold elections. Of course, we decided who we could choose from, as the most promising leaders had either been assassinated or imprisoned by Israel. And so the choice really came down to Fatah, which had become viewed as a corrupt collaborator or Hamas, which at the time had proven itself to respond to the needs of the Palestinian people and to be in opposition to Israel. Yet we made shocking outrage when the Palestinians faced with this choice of the Hamas. But Israel did not want Palestinian leaders that did not do its bidding, and so, supported by the United States, it forced this elected government of all of Palestine into Gaza it kept friendly public in power in the West Bank. Israel's noose around Gaza continually tightened, exerting totalitarian control over your life down to your caloric intake, who you may love, whether your child may get cancer to you, whether she may play the violin, or whether she may accept the scholarship she won to a prestigious university abroad. Want to feed your family? Well, Gaza has fertile fishing grounds, but the Israeli Navy will kill you if you venture into the more fertile parts of your own sovereign waters. And the sea close to the shore is contaminated because Israel bombed your waste processing plant and blocks its repair. Or you can farm, but you'll be shot dead by an Israeli sniper or a remote control tower if you approach Gaza's most fertile ground furthest from the shore. Meanwhile, Israel uses you, your family, and Gaza's entire trapped population for field testing its weapons, and on any pretext, launches all-out massacres. Israel's carnage against Gaza in the summer of 2014 alone had roughly the same human carnage 
as the 9-11 terror attacks. In actual numbers, I'm not adjusting for population. And the excuse was every bit as obscene. The U.S. Congress applauded it. And when you think about it, why shouldn't it? After all, it was their massacre as much as Israel's. Israel's guarantee of execution for any attempt by a non-Jew to return home has only tightened since 1948. In the so-called Great March of Return of 2018 to 19, hundreds of people were shot dead or permanently and deliberately crippled by Israeli snipers for a nearly symbolic show of just approaching the impenetrable barrier of the Gaza Ghetto. To be clear, this is, this is not even rise to the level of civil disobedience. They were confined in the concentration camp in which we locked them and were murdered merely for the symbolism of their most rudimentary human rights. There could be no better proof of the fact of and the futility of Palestinian peaceful resistance which goes back decades and into the pre-state period. Meanwhile, Israel continued to ethnically cleanse people from both East Jerusalem and the West Bank. Thousands of non-Jews in the West Bank continued to be kidnapped and taken hostage by Israel and hundreds murdered. But Hamas, the government elected to defend them, was pulled up in Gaza and denied any conventional means of defense, military or political. The only thing it could do was lob primitive rockets over the barrier of protest, most hitting the land on the immediate other side, which ironically is actually the home of many of the people interned in Gaza. Yet, when 75 years of this pressure, inferno, blew up on the morning of October 7th, we said with a straight face and with my remember baffled from Jay's stories. We said that there's no excuse for terrorism. One crime we know for sure that Hamas committed that day was the taking of hostages. After 75 years of Israel kidnapping Palestinians, currently only 10 to 11,000 hostages, Hamas kidnaps a couple of under his leverage, and suddenly we work, we learned that there's no excuse for it. The question of why our governments will destroy us, personally, professionally, collectively, morally, to empower Israel's crimes is a mystery that, to which I don't have a satisfactory answer, but I don't think we should get sidetracked by it because our governments are amoral organisms that power ahead in their own interests. It is not for a lack of understanding or a lack of information that the Biden administration is conducting genocide. But our government <laughs> our governments do require our passive complicity. So the question becomes, how has the public been kept ignorant of what is being done in their name? Typically, we have fought against the bubble in which we live by exposing Israel's crimes. And this is obviously this is very important. But the 76 years of exposing Israel's crimes has not stopped them. It has not stopped them because even when news of Israel's crime reaches us, we filter it through quote unquote narrative. That is, sophisticated marketing. Israel has above all been a marketing project. As the USA branch of the Eru back in the 1940s described it, they fundraised, quote, just the way you advertise Chevrolet motor cars or players of cigarettes. So we need to go beyond Israel's crimes and expose its structures of impunity. How to get us addicted to a product that makes a mockery of every value we claim the whole year? Well, we start with an unassailable brand, Israel. A name that touches a chord deep within our collective cultural subconscious. A word originating in Genesis itself, a place seemingly created by God. A word celebrated in Hebrew scriptures and praised in church. In short, a name that even the secular among us are culturally wired to honor. 
And Israel, the modern nation state, openly positions itself as that place. The land's ancient artifacts as the nation's artifacts and its settlers as the biblical land's people. Zionism is the grand messianic theater. As Ben-Gurion explained cynically in private, without the name Israel, they'd never get enough settlers. Nor would they include participants in the theater without Palestine itself, the all important stage on which the great messianic theater plays out. It's sometimes mentioned, by the way, that Herzl, uh, founder of modern Zionism, considered, uh, considered other locations. But he was explicit that these were only meant as stepping stones to Palestine if Palestine could not be gone at first. So they marketed their state as the reconstitution of the biblical realm in Palestine, reversing the standard seven colonial narrative. Instead of commandeering other people's lands through claims of the divine right or manifest destiny, the Zionist narrative was the opposite. They were not settlers, but were simply going wrong after a hiatus of two or three thousand years. Thus, the Zionist genocide is a step beyond even those of colonial Europe, because the Zionist claim of indigenousness requires that it replace the native people not just physically, but also metaphysically erasing them by expropriating their cultural iconography as its own in order to become the native. It is genocide in its fullest sense. It's as if, for example, as if Spanish colonizers in South and Central America were to have claimed that all Mayan and Incan and Aztec artifacts and culture, food and music, etc., were actually those of ancient Spaniards. And that the people found they were interlopers with no right to them. The Zionist resurrection of Hebrew as the vernacular was also necessary for the theater of the messianic return to the biblical lands and was imposed by force. It, too, is an ancient artifact serving to place the Israeli state in a protected part of our collective psyche. Hebrew makes the step of stepping on Palestine. Palestinian land for the first time, a native of the biblical kingdom, and to criticize someone speaking Hebrew is, in the narrative, to criticize Jews. And like all successful products, the, the project needed a logo for which it patented the once multicultural starting date. Zionism also had to assure steady customers. The most successful method is to, to create an addiction to your product. And Zionism has managed this brilliantly by turning itself into a cult. More on that soon. And finally, the project needed a slogan, and so it trademarked the Jewish state as its slogan. But what does the slogan mean? We accept this trilogy of words of the Jewish state with little thought. After all, as Israel's of the defenders tell us, there are Christian states and Buddhist states and Muslim states and Hindu states. And Israel is the only Jewish state with the insinuation that if you're against it, that must be why. No, this is false advertising. Israel is the only Jewish state, not in the sense that there are happening to be no others, but because by Israel's construct, there can be no other. The key word here is the article, the. Israel claims to be the, not a, Jewish state. Its claim over Jews is global and involves ethnicity, DNA, not citizenship. If you're Jewish, it claims to own you. The very sound of the term, the Jewish state, demands an unqualified respect and creates a, a magic shield, a, a force field around, around Israel, warning us not to challenge the state. It shoots its bullets without leaving any forensic evidence, like a, 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 a talisman that rewards off enemies without leaving any trace. For example, I'm sure many of us here have heard, why are you always criticizing the Jewish state? 
But what Israel really means by its slogan is an affront and deserves condemnation. What Israel means by it is the perversion of Jewish identity into racial nationalism. It means that the state must enforce a Jewish majority privacy, which it defines by blood descent and preserves this alleged blood purity by way of laws forbidding so-called mixed marriages between a Jew and a non-Jew as defined by the state. All others on the land must remain both minority and legally lesser human beings. Thus, the Israeli state, by its own self-definition, a definition we have embraced, has no choice but to keep millions of human beings in internment camps. No choice but to make a part by driven to see. No choice but to kill people for the crime of going home or not Jewish, and ultimately to conduct genocide. As long as we endorse the existence of a state based on the blood descent supremacy of an important population, we have endorsed these crimes. If the people of the land simply went home, if people were equal under the law, the state would cease to exist, and that is what must happen. No nation state has an intrinsic right to exist. Nation states are a 19th century invention. People, everyone there now, by which, to be sure, let's include all the settlers, but above all, everyone who has been ethnically cleansed, they have the intrinsic right to exist as people on that land, river to sea. But Israel, <laughs> but Israel has this magic shield around it that other former race states, such as apartheid South Africa, did not. So it, it, let's put the Israeli state on the allegorical lab table, unscrew the cover, and look inside to see what powers this magic shield. If we do this, we'll find that its energy source, uh, the energy source is a hostage. That hostage being Jewish identity. The Israeli state's claim to be the very embodiment of everything and everyone is Jewish. Deny Israel this anti-Semitic hijacking of Jewish identity as a human shield and its seemingly impenetrable armor vaporizes. And this holding of Jewish identity hostage is the explosive behind Israel's most powerful military weapon, its wielding of the smear of anti-Semitism to silence opposition to its crimes. It, it's a very, very simple and obvious mechanism. What, what Israel does, the Jews do. And so to accuse the state of crimes is to accuse Jews as Jews of those crimes. But Israel has a big problem on its hands here that we have failed to exploit. Where else have we heard this direct linkage between the actions of a state and a group? It's a straightforward definition of common bigotry, racist, blame individual by virtue of blame oneness between a state and a nationality or type. And so during the spread of COVID-19, for example, Chinese-looking people were attacked. Why? The virus came from China. They, the Chinese, caused COVID. This is classic ignorant bigotry and we all get that. Israel's magic shield, its force field, works by committing precisely this crime against Jews, but turning them around in order to hold Jewish identity hostage to insulate its crimes. But instead of condemning Israel for this anti-Jewish racism, we run in fear from it. Other states deflect criticism of their crimes by hiding behind the flag, accusing dissenting citizens of being unpatriotic to the state. Israel hides behind the ethnicity free of borders, accusing dissenting voices anywhere of being traitors to the ethnicity. Why have we let Israel get away with this? Traditional anti-Semitism, for all its horrors, is powerless to harm the integrity of Jews or Judaism. In other words, it's powerless to make its libels true. The Israeli state Zionists, if we accept them at their word, succeed. 
If we accept their claims on Jewish identity, then we are the common races, blaming Jews as Jews. But through decades of fascistical control, which I will speak more about, Zionism has created a cult that believes that yes, the ideology and the Israeli state are an inextricable part of you, your DNA, part of your identity, not something you have a choice over. And thus, the psychosis of people trying to square this with wanting to believe that they are nice, fair-minded people. And unlike conventional cults for which society offers an escape and refuge, this cult has been mainstreamed by way of the amoral politics of convenience of Israel's sponsorships. We must acknowledge that this, a cult, is what we face. And that the altar of this cult, or that's how I would put it, is logically the very fuel the Israeli state and Zionism need to survive. Anti Semitism. Anti Jewish bigotry is not a disease that the Israeli state seeks to eliminate. It is rather the drug to which it must keep the flock addicted. Escaping the cult of the, of the Zionists is, to say the least, difficult. But learning the stories of people who have escaped can only add to courage and confidence. For anyone to whom this might apply, I would very much recommend a book by Harold Archer called Reclaiming Judaism from Zionism, which is a collection of such experiences. Israel needs anti Semitism, real or imagined, as a permanent state of humanity, and so anti Semitism has become a racket. For many years, organizations such as the, uh, the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism, the Community Service Trust, the Board of Deputies, or here in the U.S., the Anti-Defamation League, have been devoted to maintaining an ever-increasing hysteria over anti-Semitism. Without it, the state loses its supposed reason to exist, loses its lore for settlers, loses its image for fundraising, loses its pretense of facing a never-ending existential threat to justify its crimes, loses its ability to control its devotees through fear, and loses the cry of anti-Semitism to keep us quiet. But why should this tactic work to silence us? What on earth does anti-Jewish bigotry, real or not, have to do with Palestinian human rights? Well, nothing. Nothing. We condemn anti-Semitism as we condemn all bigotry, not because this particular kind of bigotry has anything special to do with us. That is part of Zionism's systematic dehumanization of Palestinians, and we are harming the cause for justice if we cower to it. But to the practical question, what do we do when we are falsely smeared with the anti-Semitism label in order to silence us? Absolute rule, never respond on the terms handed to you. Do not respond with protestation of your innocence or with any form of pseudo-apology for anything you didn't do, thinking you will play KB Inquisitors. When the, the scarlet letter A for anti-Semitism is scrawled on your chest, you should instead correctly, accurately, boomerang the charge of anti-Semitism back. And it must include the words that the sneer was intended to silence. So for example, depending on the situation, you might say something to the effect of, no, now hold on here, I'm arguing for equality and human rights of Palestine. You are sneering the Jews as opposing these. Okay, the court of public opinion might say, okay, the Israeli state may not be perfect, but Zionism and Israel exist to serve the security and emancipation of Jews. That's what they're all about. Well, no. They are about the opposite. The historical record makes it clear that the actual goal of the Zionist movement, its driving force, was not the welfare or dignity of the Jews, but rather the Zionist state itself at the expense of Jews. 
Jews perished at the hands of the Nazis because of Zionism. During the terrible years of the late 1930s through to the end of the Second World War, Zionist leaders consistently fought against safe haven for Jews unless that safe haven was a Palestine. That is, unless it served Zionists. It was not simply a matter of not pursuing safe haven anywhere in safe countries, which already been pretty bad, but actively and even violently blocking. I'll cite one particularly clear example from late 1942 during the height of the Holocaust involving the efforts of Solomon Schoenfeld, a British rabbi who had been a primary figure in the kinder transport that had saved many Jewish children on the eve of the war, and that had very, by the way, opposed because the children were going to England, not Palestine. Schoenfeld worked to get the British government to arrange a safe passage for Jews who were in ISIS territory. I will quote from him. In view of the massacres and starvation of Jews and others interested in enemy and tell territories, he gathered support for a motion for the UK, quote, to declare its readiness to find a temporary refuge in its own territories or in territories under its control for endangered persons. Now, this, of course, was precisely what the world needed, and inertia for this project grew quickly. But with passage of the rest of effort in sight, the Board of Deputies of British Jews, a Zionist organization, assisted from the United States by Stephen Wise, President of the World Jewish Congress, a Zionist organization, intervened and sabotaged and admonished Schoenfeld, quote, in no uncertain terms, that they, the Board of Deputies, Wise, the Zionist establishment, would do whatever was necessary to squash government support for the rescue. Now, Wise himself had just held a press conference days early in the U.S. Capitol to spread the alarm that the Nazis planned the extermination of European Jews. They all knew about the death camps. But the Zionists sabotaged the rescue because it worked against Zionism. Indeed, it was at this time that the Jewish agency, what would become the Israeli government, railed against non-Zionist Jews, like Schoenfeld, as its enemy. Zionism was indeed a cult in the making. As Britain's war cabinet warned at the time, quote, any Jew who openly opposes the party line is in personal danger, and indeed most victims of Zionist assassinations during the mandate years, that is, targeted killings of the specific individuals rather than victims of general carnage, were Jews eliminated for opposing Zionism. A 1943 report by U.S. intelligence described Zionism in Palestine as, quote, a type of nationalism which in any other country would be stigmatized as retrograde Nazis. Indeed, the very same doctrine of blood and soil is being indicated. It permeates the name Jewish, not merely Zionist, systems of education. Presciently, the U.S. report stated that anti-Semitism was essential to Zionism. And whereas, quote, assimilated Jews in Europe and America are known for being stout opponents of racialism and discrimination. Zionism has instead bred, quote, a spirit closely akin to Nazism, namely an intent to regulate the community even by force and to resort to force to get what they want. The prominent journalist Robert Felch, who had fled the Nazis, warned that Zionist leaders, quote, have not yet understood that the enemy seeks the destruction of the Jews. We, who have been here in Palestine, only a few years, we know that Nazi exists. The Zionists rather are taking part in the clash of European Jewry only as enemies. They do not want to fight against Hitler because of his fascist methods are also theirs. The senior inspector of Jewish schools in Palestine 
In great secrecy, he risked his life to warn about the threat of science. Also describing him as a carrier of the Nazism and alluding to his cult like nature with warnings about the difficulty of stopping it once it has taken root. Now, I want to clarify that I personally don't make these Nazi parallels, unless there's some specific historical reason for doing so. But I cite this British and American intelligence to illustrate Zionism's fascistical cult on Jews, leading to the cult nature of Zionism today. Uh, if anyone is interested in my reasons not for making the parallels, uh, please ask me in the q and I also cited these reports from the 1940s from U.S. British intelligence to note that the U.S. and U.K. fully understood the nature of the project they were supporting all the way back then pre state Behind closed doors, the Jewish agency discussed its enemies. And what it considered enemies, what it considered enemies back then says quite a lot about the present. Its enemies were democracy, the Atlantic Charter, which of course became the basis of the United Nations, reconstruction. They were afraid that the improvement of conditions in Europe, the pressure on Palestine was inside, and they feared a fall in anti Semitism. Ben Gurion lamented that, quote, the democracies, in contrast to the dictator states, recognized the Jews as people having full rights as citizens. And the Jewish state is playing what it believed to be the crime and has had a visit to the United States on what it called America's Democratic Act. Meanwhile, in Europe, the Zionists coerced the Allies to separate the Jews from all other TVs, displaced people, into Zionist camps, where they were literally brainwashed into the Zionist playbook, such that when a US UK committee visited them in 1946 and asked if they might like to emigrate and resettle in the United States, which had always been the favorite destination. They were by a unison in absolute terror that they would commit mass suicide if they had to go to the United States. In 1944, U.S. President Roosevelt arranged for safe haven and new homes for half a million displaced people from the war. More than half of these to be resettled in the United States and Britain. Again, once the plan was headed for success, the United States and Zionists sabotaged. Many Jewish children whose parents had perished the Holocaust were being raised in adopted European families. And so the chief Ashkenazi rabbi of the Palestine settlements, a rabbi person, ran a kidnapping operation in Europe, forcing the children from their families, making them orphans for a second time to ship them to Palestine as a human father. It's important to point out that Herzog's fiercest opposition came consistently from local European Jewish leaders who had the children's interests at heart rather than the interests of Zionists. But Herzog used political force to circumvent them whenever he could. The kidnapping were rationalized by others at the time on the grounds that as terrible as it was to tear the children away from their families, it was understandable that Herzog would want them to be in Jewish families rather than Christian families. As Herzog himself said in justification for his kidnappings, for a Jew to be raised as a Christian is, his quote, much worse than a physical murder. Now, think what you want of that in theory, but it too was a lie. Because the Zionists stopped Jewish orphans from reaching their Jewish adopted families in England in order to ship them to Palestine as ethnic father as well. Zionism was over everything. Jews and Jewish suffering were Zionism's fuel for its settlers. That the Israeli narrative now presents Israel and the Zionist movement as the torture era of the moral way of European anti-Jewish persecution and the Holocaust is obscene to the extreme. They are the cynical exploitation of the memory of Israel's victims, and we should not be afraid to say so. As Israel invokes their memory to help it carry out the same crime of racial nationalism. 
Even regarding the Allied war effort, the Zionists consistently placed their ideology above the struggle to defeat fascism. It lobbied the Yisha, the uh, Jewish settlers, not to join the Allied forces because it would not serve Zionism unless, unless Britain formed a segregated Jewish army that was an encumbrance on the war effort, but that the Zionists could use to claim it was an implicit acknowledgement of Jewish nationality and therefore state. The Zionists conducted a massive factoring of Allied weapons and munitions, as if, to quote one British writer at the time, as if made by Hitler himself. It continued its terrorism in Palestine, taking resources and personnel away from the war. The British begged the Zionists to stop their terror until Hitler was defeated, but to no avail. And by the mid 1940s, Zionist terrorism had become the defining daily challenge of life in Palestine. Anyone or anything that kept Palestine a functioning society was a target of the Zionists. Trains, roads, bridges, communications, oil facilities, and coast guard stations were constantly being bombed. Utility workers, telephone repairmen, railway workers, bomb disposal, disposal personnel were murdered. Police, and especially Jewish police, were long a favorite part of the Zionists and were gunned down by the dozens. Among the smaller terror organizations that popped up was one specifically dedicated to the Zionists' long running fear of Jews befriending non Jews, the ultimate fear, of course, the polluting what for the Zionists was the pure Jewish race. The terror group is said to have doused a disobedient Jewish girl with acid, blinding in with one eye. Zionist terror was aided by the Jewish agency's phenomenal intelligence network. The agency had performers all the way up to high places of sympathetic U.S. officials, such that the British were not even to trust direct messages of U.S. President Truman. Even when unstuck, the UN committee tasked with recommending a solution to the Palestine problem visited Palestine in the summer of 1947. The agency had already replaced the committee members' primers with spies, had replaced the waiters at the main restaurant they frequented with spies, and most productively sent five young women to serve at what they call a theater network of house attendants at the building where the Unscut Committee, all of them men, were being housed. The young women were required to be smart and educated, but above all, in the agency's word, they were required to be daring. We don't know what daring meant, but whatever it meant, they extracted a wealth of information from the key people who were about to decide Palestine's future. And so, with Unscum, we arrive at November 1947 and the partitioning of when you question Israel's right to exist, you will also be renewed with this creation that none of today's horror existed as well, because two years after the war, the United Nations offered both the Zionists and the Palestinians a state. General Assembly Resolution 181, Israel's founders embraced the offer with gratitude, whereas the Palestinians scoffed at it. In the words of the prominent Zionist watchdog, Cameron, the quote, fundamental fact is that had the Palestinians only accepted partition, there would have been a Palestinian state since 1948, and there would not have been a single Palestinian refugee. Now, the, the logic itself here is moronic, but let's leave that aside. The idea that the Zionists agreed to partition is fiction. They were fanatically opposed to partition had been preparing for years to defeat it militarily, and everyone involved knew it. But within the walls of the UN, the Jewish agency made a clever gesture. They feigned acceptance of partition because it had to be stated. Statehood was the single weapon powerful enough to defeat partition, to seize all the land, and to cleanse it of non Jews. Statehood was the key to everything. And this strategy of the Zionists even predates 
the 1937 Peel Commission, which was the first formal proposal for partition. Hein Weizmann, who becomes the first president, Hein Weizmann, and who was considered a monarch, described the plan to Benito Mussolini when he met with the Italian fascist in 1934, hoping to make a deal with them to leverage against the British. In the interest of time, I would just summarize by saying that the Zionist determination that there would never be a Palestinian state, that they would take all of Palestine at a minimum, and that they would expel the lands non Jews was explicit and unwavering throughout the three decades from the end of World War I through to Israel's self declaration of statehood in the non. And that supposed moderates like Weizmann were every bit as fanatical as the acknowledged terrorists. But there was one possible glitch in their plans. And that would be if the British, or ultimately the United Nations, were to propose a state of all the people, whether a true single state or binational state, instead of partition. This would make their job vastly more difficult. And indeed, when Munzkop presented his recommendation, there were two proposals, partition or a binational single state. So, presented with both options, why? Was a state of all its people the loser? The obvious answer based on history is actually stated outright in British cabinet papers at the time. The answer is fear of Zionist terrorists. The UN selected partition because they knew that if they didn't, the Zionists would have responded with, quote, an intensification of Jewish terrorism, that is, an intensification of Zionist terror, beyond that which had already caused Palestine to its knees, and more to the point of the people making the decisions, was increasingly threatening Europe. Now, having selected partition in principle, the UN had to map this partition. So, how to explain that their partition gave more than half of the land of the Zionists, who, despite the massive influx of settlers, were still a minority? The answer to that lays to rest any lingering question that the UN knew that Israel would ignore partition, and that the whole exercise was a shred. Again, quoting British records about the partition from, quote, the desire for expansion might develop earlier if the Jewish state occupied a smaller area. So the UN simply hoped to delay, not prevent, but merely delay Israel's first expansionist war by giving them so much up front. This appeasement, of course, failed because Israel's, uh, uh, Israel began its first expansionist war beyond this immediately. And note that it is implicit throughout this that the UN also assumed in advance that its own Security Council would do nothing to stop it. Throughout the year before partition, there is consistent proof that both the British and the Americans knew perfectly well that the Zionists planned to ignore partition and that they would be no Palestinian state. Partition was a scam, and above all, the Palestinians, who, by the way, counted proposed that the Constitution, similar to that of the United States, knew it was a scam. But in the world as it is, statehood is our measure of all things. Having achieved the mantle of statehood, the Zionist terrorism became Israeli military actions. Whereas when the Palestinians denied the voting of statehood, their true self-defense was now terrorism. The cure for today's horror is what should have happened in 1947-48, one secular democratic state river to see everyone there now who wishes to become an equal citizen in a shared society. And equality means, by definition, that the internment camps are liberated and every refugee has citizenship in the new state.
best at laying and venerate, suddenly becomes controversial, scandalous, even in speech, when it is applied to Israel Palestine. Of course, because the simple act of equality would be the dissolution of the state. Now, just to, in closing, for 76 years, we have lamented the disease's ravages while obeying a taboo against addressing the disease itself. And for 76 years, the Palestinians have paid the price. Now, Israel's unbridled savage, since October 7, have, uh, has elicited such worldwide revulsion that we can see cracks in Israel's armor. The cracks hand us an unprecedented opportunity to fight back in the endlessly imaginative ways we can wield the main weapon we have, our voices. First, to stop the apocalypse of Gaza, and then the century-old injustice itself, to which genocide was always not just the inevitable result, but the intended result. This opportunity has come at a at a terrible cost, and we must not respond to them. Thank you. Who don't know me, my name is James, and I am a member of the Vermont Coalition for Palestinian Liberation. Uh, thank you for attending tonight. Um, UVM respects and values free expression, including the lawful expression of dissent. Dissent is welcome, so long as it does not interfere with the ability of the speaker to deliver the message or the ability of the audience to receive the speaker's message. An individual whose actions interfere in this manner will be warned. If the individual or group continues to interfere, they will be escorted out and will be held accountable under relevant university policies. Our goal is to have a peaceful and respectful event. We appreciate your cooperation. Q&A will be done through this QR code. You can visit on your phone and we will select questions from there. As people are there uh, submitting their questions, uh, we would like to ask you an initial question. Uh, if you could speak a little on your personal background, uh, what sort of primed you in your uh, formative uh, years learning about the Palestinian struggle and what brought you to uh, adopt it as an area of uh, focus for your academic work? Uh, thank you. Is this working? Okay. Uh, that's a long story. My father fought the Nazis, and growing up, uh, my siblings and I, we, uh, we were raised with very much of an awareness of the history behind it. We were raised with a great sense of being responsible for what is done in our names. Um, I came of age during the height of the U.S. war against, the U.S. led war against Vietnam, and like many people of all ages at the, at the time was very active in the fight to stop that war against Vietnam. Uh, time went on, and Palestine started to look like yet another uh, colonial war of aggression for which my country is principally responsible. Uh, so I was very interested in the topic and uh, eventually I, 
I went to Palestine. My, my partner in the UK, she and I went to Palestine. And I think here I, I fit the um, a very common scenario where once you're there, you can't believe what you're seeing. You heard all these things for years, and then you're, you're there, and you see what is actually happening, and you see that, that the news that we're getting, you can't even call it inaccurate, because inaccurate suggests that there's some element of truth, but that, no, the reality was so divorced from anything that we were being told that you, can, you cannot forget it. Now, my background, my actual profession, I'm, I'm a violinist. I'm a classically trained violinist. So I started teaching in the, in the West Bank. I, I lived in the West Bank. I taught at the, um, the East Jerusalem branch of the Palestine National Conservatory of Music. So every day I crossed back and forth, checkpoint 300. After Cass led in the summer of 2014, uh, there had been a very good Russian violin teacher at the Gaza City branch of the conservatory. She had gone home for the summer, cast that hit, and she either couldn't or had decided not to return after that. So they asked me to take her place, uh, which I uh, was very happy to have the author. I, uh, the offer I immediately agreed. But the conservatory and I spent the next year trying to get past the siege. I, uh, I had been to Gaza years earlier, but for a year, as the violin teacher of the violin students in Gaza City, was never able to meet my students in person. Just to be sure they didn't feel that they were forgotten, I taught from Bethlehem by Skype whenever their electricity was working. And uh, to the point when it became impossible. One of my one of my students, who was very young at the time, I was one of her first teachers, uh, age of 14 this past November, she and her family lived in Gaza City. They were told to go to a place south by the Israeli military. They did, and of course, they got there. Israel bombed it. She and her entire family and extended family were wiped out. Here I am. Thank you. We have a few questions to start off. I'll uh, pick this one. It's a rather broad question. Um, how does one educate someone that Zionism is racial supremacy? I think the answer to that is very easy. You just ask them, okay, do you agree that, that everybody should be equal under the law? Do you do agree with this? If you do, then you, have, then you have to acknowledge that the Israeli state ceases to exist. Why does it cease to exist? Because it's based on racial supremacy. If you remove racial supremacy, then, then the interned people go home, then there's no longer any apartheid. And people will say, oh no, everybody's equal in the law in, in Israel. So that's, this is great news, this is great news, because then the actual human beings who are thrown off the land have the same right to go home as people who have, who have never been there in their lives. So this, this, this is all, this all becomes hocus pocus in order to claim that it's not racial nationalism. All you have to do is just, it just keep them to, keep the person you're speaking to, to the point, everybody is equal under the law and there's no way to get around this. We have another question. I'm going to um, editorialize a bit, just, um, to uh, focus a bit more, um, what is your suggested response to Jewish friends and acquaintances here in the U.S. who uh, declare that they don't feel safe in uh, the context of the uh, sort of mass movement that has emerged in recent months? I would say that they have been hoodwinked by the Zionist lie that 
somehow human rights for Palestinians is somehow endangered Jews. No, this is a libel and has to be exposed as such. You know, the, this, the, the anti-Semitism meter is, is turned up every time something happens. When I live in the UK, when Jeremy Corbyn, who was just this old peacenik guy, who was just this diseases flower guy, and when he became uh, later uh, leader of the uh, Labour Party, he was known for being quote unquote pro-Palestinian. Now, so immediately what happened was there was this huge outcry that that Jews are so terrified in London that they that they have to leave. They fear for their lives. There was actually a headline in one of the main London papers that read that that. Jews feel as threatened as they did during the Holocaust, comma, experts say. This was a headline. It gets this crazy. And when do we get to the point that we insist that the media be held to account to say, what is your criteria? How, uh, what is your methodology? And what is your, now, of course, the criteria is going to be the uh, IHRA a pseudo definition of anti Semitism, where everything, all of us in this room probably are anti Semites according to this, into this definition. Now, this definition is itself anti Semitic because the, the definition claims that it's anti Semitic to hold Jews responsible for the actions of the Israeli state. Of course, yes, this, of course. But that is exactly what the definition does in order to shield the state. So again, uh, I, I think that when someone says that they're Jewish and therefore they feel unsafe, I, I think they, if they're sincere about that, I think they need to be brought back to reality and to be asked, what is it exactly about this person having the same rights as you that makes you feel unsafe? We have another question. It's uh, let's see, a bit of a hardball question. Uh, how do you grapple with your uh, position as a uh, non-Palestinian or someone who uh, is not um, indigenous to Palestine um, when you move to Palestine, or what um, some might consider a settler? When I went to Palestine to live, I went there at the invitation of Palestinians. And I don't believe in, in this idea that, that somehow Palestine is this closed society that, that has to be preserved intact. I think the Palestinians have the absolute right to do whatever they want. If they want to learn a Western musical instrument, that's, that's, that's what they should do if that's what they want to do. Palestinians, a Palestinian organization run by Palestinians, asked me if I would go to teach. And that obviously is what I should have done. Can you talk about Right, uh, Clan Dalit and um, Greater Israel. Do you know if this uh, um, sort of ultra expansionist sect is uh, mainstream in Israeli political and polite society? Um, just to clarify the uh, kind of ultra nationalist aspiration to both uh, uh, Zionist occupation in Jordan, Lebanon, uh, Sinai even Saudi Arabia by uh, some uh, fringes. Can you speak to any of that? Uh, I, I can tell you, of course, that originally the Zionists had claimed all of the uh, Eretz Israel, the entire biblical land of what, uh, of course, Israel was, was to my understanding, actually a, a small region of that uh, larger area. But yes, the Zionists originally claimed that they had the entire region for their, their settlements. And up through, certainly up through the very, uh, the, the end before the Second World, 
before I'm sorry, before the uh, UN partition, they were still talking about annexing Jordan. And what happened was that the British gave independence to Jordan, which was received with, uh, there were two theories within the Zionist establishment. One was, why did the British, the British do that? Because we wanted that. And the other was, no, actually that's good because it's much easier to steal it from the quote unquote Arabs than to steal it from the British. Now, whether any, uh, whether there's any large movement in Israel today that expects that not only will the state continue, but that it will annex land beyond the, uh, the Jordan River or into Lebanon or Egypt, I, I don't think it's taken seriously, but I don't know. Can you talk a little bit about how the United States uh, profits and benefits from the continuation of the Israeli state, and specifically, why is it so important uh, for the U.S. to the U.S. state to, uh, in its own mind, unequivocally support and defend Israel? Wow. Well, as I mentioned in my talk, I don't know. <laughs> uh, as I mentioned, uh, to try to answer the question, we do know, okay, there's the the uh, U.S. advantage of having a pied terre in the Middle East. That's one reason. There's the arm industry. That's another reason. There's APAC. That's another reason. There are the Christian Zionists. In the United States, most Zionists are Christian. They're a big voting bloc. There's all this. And in my opinion, in my opinion, you add up all these things, and it does not explain the degree of U.S. fealty. Take, take Biden as an example. Now, Biden could very well lose his, his bid for a second term because of his fealty to Israel. There's such outrage against him. Yet, you would have thought, you would have thought that his uh, winning the November election was about everything. And he could have handled Gaza in such a way as to fudge it better. But no, he's so blatant about it. How to explain that? I can. There, there are people. I've had this argument with with um, people who, in the larger picture, share my views. People who say that the most simply U.S. imperialism explains everything. That in view of U.S. imperialism, Israel is a bargain. I don't agree with that. And I cannot explain why the U.S. fealty to Israel is as extreme as it is. Uh, by the way, uh, in one person I should have mentioned in, uh, to explain how I ended up here today, one very dear friend of mine, Radha Karma, who is one of the actual human beings shoved off the land in 1948, she also, she's a, she has been a professor of Arabic studies and knows the history of the region very well. She taught at Exeter University in the UK. She also shares my view on this, that she is at a loss to explain it, that there is something we don't know. You mentioned um, the existence of socialists and communist Zionists. Um, this question reads, as a communist here, I have sometimes observed the same uh, hubris and racism that defines what we are supposed to be fighting permeate into our movements. Uh, a lot of people seem to think that because they learned what the rest of the world en masse has uh, known for years, that uh, capitalism is bad, uh, that we are therefore on the right side of all issues. Looking at the history of uh, quote-unquote left-wing Zionism, do you think there's anything relevant for uh, white Americans and the left in America to understand? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure I understand what the question is. I, I, I did not speak about communism or socialism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is uh, just what the question reads. I think, um, let's reframe a bit. Um, given the historical uh, existence, especially in the earlier days of uh, the Zionist project, the existence of uh, 
left-wing uh, labor Zionism. Um, what uh, relevant lessons do you think there are for the left in the U.S., which is itself a settler colony, to take away, to uh, avoid or correct falling into the same pitfalls as uh, quote unquote left-wing Zionism? I don't know how to answer that because I've never understood left-wing Zionism. <laughs> I, I don't know how to square that that circle. So I I, I really don't don't know how to answer. That. Sure. Let's see. Um, here's a question that uh, you might be uh, positioned to speak to on account of your uh, personal experience in Palestine. Can you talk about the Palestinian celebration of life? despite occupation. Uh, here's a case where not being Palestinian, I don't think I really am the person to ask. Uh, obviously, my experience there, uh, Palestinians, they, they keep their dignity and they try to get on with their lives. Uh, I also think there is the danger and I see the, uh, the liberal U.S. media falling into this trap. There's the danger of uh, making the Palestinian people into heroes in the wrong sense. That, ah, oh, look, they're, they look at how bravely they endure their suffering. I think that this is a mistake. But no, as, as far as the uh, Palestinians, they're the same humans as everybody else in the world. They were born into the situation. In most cases, their parents and even grandparents were born in this situation. They get on with their lives as best they can, with dignity. Thank you. You spoke about uh, Joe Biden. How about uh, Jimmy Carter? Because uh, the perception is that he was devoted to peace in the Middle East, um, but was or is this an illusion? Uh, that's a, a, a nuanced answer i think that obviously jimmy carter was better than most of them but i think that his attempt to solve the issue was misguided i don't think for example i don't think making peace with egypt you know, where you're simply getting egypt on board with the colonial project was the answer no Thanks everyone who's uh, asking questions. We're uh, getting a lot of uh, questions right now, so uh, we apologize if we uh, can't get to yours. I think we'll uh, have three more questions and uh, then we will adjourn. Um, but let's see. Can you expand on your critique of the term occupation in this situation? The term occupation, I am very leery of, of it being used in terms of, of the fight for Palestinian liberation. And here's the thing. When we say the occupation, first of all, what do we mean by that? What is this occupation? Well, I think most people would say it's geographic, okay? Then you ask people, Where's the, where's the borders? What, what geography is this occupation? They say, well, everything on the Palestinian side of the armistice line, the, uh, the, the so-called 67 borders, it's, which is not exactly the armistice line, but it's, it's close. Okay, if this is the occupation, and suddenly one morning we woke up and Israel decided to unoccupy those lands, it would be a very sorry morning after. We'd end up with what? We'd have uh, these fragments of what was once Palestine that can no longer be Palestine. We'd end up with the non-Jews in the land under Israeli control, still under apartheid. We'd have the interned people, the so-called refugees, who were from the land uh, that under Israeli control, still unable to go home. So I think this, this is a mistake. The problem is not the occupation because Israel has annexed the whole damn thing, let's just face it. There is no occupation. The, it, it is the entire annexed river to sea. So the only thing you can do then 
is, is to address the problem. And the problem is inequality, extreme inequality. And what's the cure for, for inequality? Equality. To, uh, to, to find this as an occupation is, I think, very dangerous. Because if we got rid of what people think of as the occupation, it would not solve anything. I, by the way, had used the term occupation in the very specific sense of the Palestinian Authority enabling Israel to have the international community to support the, uh, the so-called uh, the land under the uh, Palestinian Authority, which saves Israel the, the trouble and the expense of doing it. I'm curious, does anyone here disagree with my critique of occupation? Can you? Do you want me to take the mic up? Uh, to me, I just think of occupation as in reference to the Israeli. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, there was so much echo, I couldn't. Sorry. Um, I think the occupation as the Israeli state as a whole and its presence on the territory that was once recognized in Palestine. So occupation to me is one of the legitimacy of the Israeli state. So, just to be sure I understood, in your, the way you mean occupation, it is the Israeli occupation of the entire land. Yeah. Well, obviously, if that's what you mean, I completely agree, but that's not what people mean when they say occupation. At least not in my experience. But if, if uh, actually, that's a very good idea. If we use the term occupation, but clarify that we mean the river to sea is the occupation, of course, that, I, I think that's a good idea. I'm not arguing with your point at all. Um, I mean, it, it was a semantic misunderstanding, maybe, on my part. Yeah, that, uh, but again, when most people, I, I think almost everybody, you say occupation, and they're either not quite sure what they mean, or they mean the armistice line. And by the way, the if you do come across this, the armistice line was never a border. We call it a 67 border, but no, the armistice line itself was a ceasefire line and not the war, which is another problem with the term occupation when it's used in the traditional sense. Because in, in, um, after the armistice, Israel was supposed to return to the partition or some other mutually agreed alternative, and it simply refused. But if we're going to use it to mean the entire land, I think then the word's fine. Thank you. Thank you for answering that. I think that's a very important uh, point of consideration. And uh, I'm going to interject with uh, my own question here that's related to that. Can you speak to uh, how you observe the kind of um, shifts in consciousness in the uh, general public in America towards um, Palestine and uh, the Israeli occupation or not occupation of uh, Palestine, particularly amongst the uh, younger generations, as someone who's uh, observed this struggle for so long? Well, in my experience, all through this, there have always been people of all ages who uh, who have supported Palestinian liberation, I think young people are the answer. I think that... <laughs> increasingly, increasingly, young people, they, they're done with this. They've had enough of this. And uh, they, they see through all this. And I think it's, 
it's a matter of time before no one is going to put up with this and that the, the so-called West and above all the United States will no longer be able to function because it will lose the, lose the support that it, the, uh, the automatic support that it has. Of course, I say the United States is the worst, which it is in the sense of, of um, running the show, but on a political level, of course, Germany is the worst, and Germany really should be called out for the fact that it, it supports Israel blindly, supposedly as some, for some sort of historical obligation, which is completely backwards. Its crime was racial nationalism. It must be called out that now it is again supporting racial nationalism. It must be called out. It, it must be called out as betraying its historical obligation. France is also very bad. The United Kingdom is very bad. And in terms of freedom, as as dangerous as it is in the United States, uh, in fact, uh, my partner uh, texted me today that I understand that there's a professor in New York State, um, I forget the name, who was just, sorry? Yes, uh, who was just let go for, I don't know exactly, but it was some comment about the, um, the uh, Hamas liberation of the camp. Uh, so yes, it's, it's dangerous in terms of your professional life and your personal life in this country, but in terms of what you can say and not get arrested, the United States is better than a few of the European countries. I think uh, it is 8.42 and we have time for one, maybe two more questions. Um, the question here reads, I read a portion of a piece contesting your book and although a large portion of it was blatantly Zionist, uh, there were some points of criticism that may be concerned as a Jew against occupation, as there are moments where you argue that certain events like the Patria disaster were cover-ups to support Zionism and Israeli occupation. Can you clarify the differences between Zionists and Jews escaping the Holocaust in Palestine? Uh, to, to be sure I understand, the, the person is mentioning a critique of... That's correct. I, I believe they're referring to um, hate and errors. Uh, the piece. Oh! <laughs> yes. Um, as a result of my previous book, two gentlemen in the United Kingdom, um, David Collier and Jonathan Hoffman, who attended early on attended a talk I had given at SOAS, the uh, School for Oriental Asian Studies at London College. They attended that talk and they brought the talk to a grinding halt. Then they uh, spread, shall we say, some misinformation about what I had said to newspapers. They filed a complaint with the UK House of Lords where I had spoken. Uh, the UK House of Lords spent, uh, initiated a three-month investigation and found their claim basis. Anyway, there's a long history of these people. They, they produced a something like 59 pages or something, of a PDF critique of, of my previous book. Anyone who is interested to see my response, if you go to my website, which is my full name, thomasforest.com, if you go to my website, I have there a rebuttal of their points, which, to be brief, are pseudo-intellectual. Just to um, refocus on a question not necessarily related to uh, the book that was within this question, can you uh, speak to um, how you view uh, any difference between Zionist settlers in 1948 and Jewish people escaping the Holocaust coming to Palestine. Okay, uh, obviously, people escaping the Holocaust, and given that uh, that their options were in fact artificially limited by the uh, limited by the uh, Zionists. Now, in that situation, they of course are completely blameless. If they're the only option, 
open to them was Palestine. Uh, earlier on, I should also say that although I think the Zionist movement was, was ill-conceived as too generous, I believe that the, the Zionist movement was an abuse from the beginning. Nonetheless, people living in uh, uh, Eastern Europe or, uh, or Russia who were the victims of pogroms, they, those people, if, if they got wind of this new idea, they could go to this beautiful land and start a life anew without, without uh, persecution. But those people are completely blameless. As time goes, goes on past 1948, then it becomes a, uh, they become settlers of choice. So yes, I do, do draw a distinction. I don't know if that answered it. Answered it for me. I think, um, let's see, we have time for one more question and uh, then we will close for the night. Um, let's see. Everyone should support the establishment of a secular democratic society with equal rights for all, including the rights of Palestinians to return to their stolen land. My question is, uh, what strategy is needed to win that new society, and what is the role of people here in the United States? I think that our tools are very limited, as I mentioned when I was speaking. The principal tool we have is, is our voices, and I am all in favor of peaceful civil disobedience. For example, I would like to commend Jewish Voice for Peace, who are heroic in this effort. But I, I, these are the only tools that we have. They are having an effect, and I think we need to ratchet them up. But my main point that I try to make is that the main change we, we need to make is that we are so used to addressing the issue on their terms. We always respond on their terms, and we need to completely just take a step back, and every time we engage, stop and think, how do we address this on our terms? All the terminology that is used. Every time you hear, uh, okay, just an example. Every time you hear a newspaper reporting about Israel, Israeli permission for aid trucks to go into Gaza. What's this with permission? No, no, get on the case with, the, with your newspaper. Say that these, no, Israel is blocking the aid truck. They don't need Israel's permission, this sort of thing that every time uh, stop and address it from the Palestinian standpoint, which is the, the one with the, uh, the, the moral right. And the, the principal weapon that's wielded against us, this thing about anti-Semitism, above all, that has to be ricocheted back to them that do not, do not fall into this thing of saying, no, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm just this and that. No, bounce it back to them and put the, the onus on them to explain why they are aligning racist ideologies with Jews, which is where the onus belongs. I know that none of this is simple, but those are the tools that we have. And the time is now for us to go into overdrive and do whatever we can to, to get our message across, to hold our media responsible and to hold our elected officials responsible. I think it's brilliant, for example, brilliant, that there is this move to deny Biden the assured vote, that even the, even the specter, even the specter of Trump, that, that no, the, you're not gonna use this extortion against us, that if you don't vote for us, you're gonna get Trump. No, we've, we're done with this, no. 
if you keep going the way you, you, you've gone, in fact, as, as far as I'm concerned, it's much too late. Nothing Biden can do now will change it. No, he does not get your vote. We have to ratchet all this up now that they, the, um, the Israeli state and the ideology are more than before being exposed for what they really are. Anyway, I want to thank all of you so much for coming. And like a copy of his latest book, Palestine Hijack, we have, we'll have limited copies available out in the lobby. Thank you all for coming tonight. Every time we took the poster down, they think one of them was 
increased uh, accusation about uh, about some other even more heinous stuff that we've heard from the past. Uh, it doesn't seem to work. And uh, I'd just like to give you any feedback uh, in terms of the uh, That would have been a reminder to go and how it died. But I'm uh, really glad. So.